Hello, this is the third video in combinatorial results. And I just call it a general and important theorem. I don't know what else to call it, but it, it helps us calculate the probability of exactly M events happening, or at most M events happening, or at least M events happening, any of those situations. Um, I'll go through some notation, show you the theorem, do an example, and then prove the theorem. And so let's just jump right in. Here, let's consider M events and AJ through, you know, AJ1 through AJM. And we're going to let the notation S0 be 1. S1 be the sum of the probabilities of the individual events. S2 be the sum of the prob all combinations of the probability of two events happening. Now, this is not saying the probability exactly two events happen. It's just saying that these two events must happen. We're not saying anything about the remaining M minus two events. Um, SR is going to be all combinations of the probability that M events happen. The, well, these specific M events happen. Um, and that's not saying anything else about the M minus R events. Uh, SM, and we only have M events, so it's the probability that all the events happen. Okay. Now the notation, you know, and here, you know, I went A is the events, and then, then I went A, B, C, D. <laughs> so B is exactly M of the events happen. C is at most M of the events occur. D, M is oh, at least and then at most M of the events occur. And here's the theorem. Okay. So the probability that exactly M events happen is this sum. Okay. Where each of those are probabilities. You know, this is the probability that, you know, all combinations that those specific M events occur, and, and this is just M plus one choose M. And anyway, so we'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, this is actually what I'm gonna derive because these are straightforward or easy. Once you know that BM is a probability exactly M events occur, well then see that you know at least M events occur is the sum of each of these probabilities. Exactly M occur, exactly M plus one occur, all the way to exactly M occur. Um, the probability at most M events occur is this sum, okay? So, and as I mentioned, the proof after the example, the example is this, that um, we have M earns M balls, both numbers numbered one to M. We're gonna randomly put balls in these urns, one ball in each urn. If a ball and urn have the same number, a match occurs. So we wanna find the probability of at least one match occurring, okay? So notation, we're going to let um, S, or let AK, be the event that a match occurs in the kth urn. Now notice that we're not saying anything about the other M minus one urns, whether there is or is not a match. This is specifically the kth urn, okay? And that's a, an important distinction in this theorem. So the probability that we have a match in the kth urn is M minus one factorial over M factorial. So wh where do we get that? So in the kth urn, there's only one way that we can observe a match, and that is the kth ball goes into it. But then there's M minus one factorial ways to distribute the remaining balls. So that's where this comes in, and this is the total number of ways to distribute the balls. So we get one over M. That's the probability of of that AK, event AK happens. We get a match in the kth urn. Um, so now S1 is the sum of these events, okay? Well, we picked AK arbitrarily. 
If we just wanted the probability of A1, the probability we have a match in the first urn, remember that it has no concerns about any of the rest of the urns, it's still going to have a probability of 1 over M. So the sum of these probabilities, each of these is, is 1 over M, and there's M of them, so the, the S1 is 1. Now, I don't think that this is the probability that we have at least one um, event. This is not. This is more than that. So this is the probability that we have that event one, or that we have a match in uh, urn one, plus the probability we have a match in urn two. Now, the probability that we have a match in uh, match in urn one also includes the, the ones that we have a match in urn two, or not a match in urn two. And so there's a lot of overlap in this sum. So now let's look at the probability that we have a match in two urns. Now notice this is K, K1 and K2. Those are just random indexes, okay? It means it could be A1 and A2, or A5 and A7. We're just picking two urns, and what's the probability that we have matches in both of those? Well, it's this right here. And when we get to that is, how many ways can we have a match in these two urns? Well, the exact balls have to be placed in those urns, so there's only one way for that to happen. And then there's M minus two factorial ways for all the other urns to be filled over the total number of ways urns can be filled. So this is the probability. Now S2 is all combinations of picking two urns at a time and then adding them up, okay? Well, every two urns is gonna have the same probability. Whatever two events we pick is gonna be this. But how many ways are we adding them up? Well, we're picking two at a time, so it's M choose two. And then if you were to, uh, you know, reduce this, you get one over two factorial, okay? Now, the probability that we have K events occur. So we, we pick specific urns, and what's the probability we have a match in every one of those? Well, it's M minus R factorial over M factorial. Remember, these specific R urns, a match, there's only one way for them to be a match, and that's we put the correct ball in every one of them. And then there's M minus R factorial ways to dis distribute the other urns over this. So that's the probability. Now, SR is the probability of all possible ways to pick R urns, and then add, you know, the probability and then add them up. Well, each of those is going to be the same. And there's M choose R ways to pick R urns. So this is the, this is SR, which is one over R factorial. Now, we um, are wanting the probability that we have at least one match. So that's one minus the probability we have zero matches. And so here, um, the, the probability that we have um, zero matches is this. Oops, let's see if I can get this in. Okay, so it's going to be S0 minus, and this is uh, 1, 2, 0, so it's 1, uh, S1, S2, S3, all the way to Sm. So we want this probability, which is this. We determine that S0 is 1, S1 is 1 over 1, S2 is 1 over 2 factorial, 1 over 3 factorial, all the way to 1 over M factorial. Then the probability of at least one match is 1 minus that we get no matches. And then, so you take 1 minus this, and you get this here. Okay. Well... Um, as M goes to infinity, this is actually a Taylor expansion for this quantity here. So it limits to this, which is 63% chance. So there's a 63% probability that we have at least one match. 
And it actually, if you go down to, you know, this is the exact probability. So if we, if we let M be 5, there's still a 63% chance. Now, if we let M be 4, then it goes down. Um, so anyway, so that's the answer, 63% chance. Um, now let's prove the theorem. And to prove it, we need, um, we, we need some background, some background notation. One, I'm gonna, we're going to look at an indicator function. So if we have any event A and outcome S such that S is in A, then th we have an indicator that's either 1 or 0 whether that event's in A. So this is like the event could be that we roll a 1 or a 2 on a die and then um, S is we rolled a 1. Well, that's in the event A. So then the indicator function is going to be a 1 because we roll a 1 is in the event roll a 1 or 2 and 0 otherwise. So now some uh, properties of uh, indicator functions is um, that the indicator for a union of events is actually equal to the product of these events. And so remember, indicator functions are either 1 or 0. And so and when, when you're multiplying zeros and ones here, because it's an indicator function, it's either 0 or 1. And the only way for this to be a 1 is that all these are 1s, which means the event is in every single AJ. Well, that's what we're trying to calculate. Now here, if the AJ are disjoint, the indicator function for this sum is actually the sum of the indicator functions. Because since the event can only be in one of these, only one of these is going to be a 1 and the rest are 0. So we get a 1 and a 1. Now the, the events have to be disjoint. Now the, the indicator for a complement, the complement of the event, is 1 minus indicator for the event. The expected value of, of the indicator function is just the probability of A. And you do that by the expected value is you take the possible values that this can assume times its respective probabilities. Well, that means take 1 times the probability of being in A and 0 times the probability in its complement. Well, that's 0. And 1 times anything is anything. So it's just the probability of A. Okay. So that's uh, the first background notation. The second one is, is a little deeper. Okay, and so let's say we have x1 through xr, and um, we want to multiply this out. Okay, when you do, you get it. You get this: one minus all the single x's, the sum of the single x's, plus the sum of all pairwise, minus the sum of all combinations of three-way, plus all combinations of four-way. And then all the way to, you know, 1 through R, all the X's together. Now, whether it's plus or minus depends whether you, this is odd or even, okay? But we're going to write this as 1. We're going to let this be called H1. And H1 means the sum of the each individual. H2 is going to be the sum of the, the all combinations of pairwise. Three, H3 is always... Uh, three-way all combinations and then all the way to HR because we have our events okay and you we you say that HA is the sum of these X's where remember this is a weird index I1 through IJ because they're the, that's a J and these are all subsets of possible combinations of the original set one through R J is one through R so when J is one this goes down to one index, and it's all combinations of one, and that's what we're saying here. And I'll go through an example to make that a little more clear. But before we do, um, this is the property that I that I want to show first, and we kind of have to understand this and prove this before we can actually prove the theorem that we want to prove. So let alpha and beta be integers greater than zero such that their sum is less than r, the number of x's that we had. So this uh, property holds. So this is the sum of the uh, put the product of x's up to, you know, there's alpha of them, and it's times h beta, but that's a function of 
J alpha, which is the number of, of alpha we have. This is, this is pretty ratchet and pretty tough to understand, but I think the example will help illustrate it. That is equal to this combination, where H alpha plus beta times this uh, combinations, um, alpha plus beta over alpha, okay? So J are subsets of our numbers, one through R. Um, actually, this is a function, H beta uh, of J alpha, it's a function of, of H of J alpha. And so what it means is we want all subsets that are of size beta, but we're gonna take out the indexes that were used in this J alpha, okay? So it's all subsets of size beta of one through R, but minus the indexes that we use for these alphas, okay? Uh, the sum is over all subsets of J alpha. That's this. Um, Okay, so now let's let's do an example to illustrate this. So um, let R be five. So there's X one through X five. We're going to let alpha be er, three and beta be one. So if we look at H four, and we're looking at H four because three plus one is four. Now all H four means all combinations of size four. So that's one, two, three, four. 1, 2, 3, 5, 1, 2, 4, 5, 1, 3, 4, 5, 2, 3, 4, 5, and add them up. That's H4, okay? Now, in the theorem, we're looking at um, alpha plus beta alpha times H4. So this is 4, so it's 4 times this, this sum, which is that, okay? So what we have done is calculated this side here which is, it's this sum times four, okay? So now we need to calculate this side, okay? So what this side is, we're gonna look at every combination of X's of size alpha. And since alpha is three, this is the, there's gonna be three X's, okay? So this is the product, that's this. So all combinations of size three. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 4, 1, 2, 5, 1, 3, 4, etc. Okay? Now this, we want all, all combinations of size beta, which is 1, minus the indexes that we used in, in, in our J alpha, which is over here. So combinations of size 1 include 1, 2, 3, you know, alpha 1 by itself, alpha 2 by itself, all the way up to X5 by itself but we're subtracted out the indexes that we used in our combination here. So since we use one, two, three here, then H beta is X4 plus X5. Now here we use the, the indexes one, two, and four. So now we want all combinations of size one minus those indexes, which is X3 plus X5. Here we use X1, X2, X5, and then here, we're subtracting out those so we get X3 plus X4. And we do that for all of these, okay? So this was this part. This was this part. It says sum over all J alpha. And these are the, all the J alphas. And we're going we're gonna to add those together. So this times that, you get this. This times that, you get that. This times that, you get that. This times that, you get this all the way down. And then it says add them all up, okay? And adding all these up should equal this, okay? So the question is, does it? So here it says we should have four of each of these terms. So this is X1, 2, 3, 4. So let's look to see to find them. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, so there's the four of those. And there's going to be four of these in here and four of those in here and, and et cetera. So this formula does work. And this is kind of, this is, well, not kind of, this is how you use it, okay? So um, to prove it more specifically, it, the left side is we're, we're picking alpha indexes from the R. That's the product of the X's, the J alpha. Then the H sub B 
as a function of J alpha is we take away the indexes that we used in alpha and we're choosing beta, beta of them. So this is the number of ways that beta can happen after we've chosen this. Now, um, that doesn't take into account uh, repeats. So this is a, an unordered sample. So we have to divide out the, the, the duplicates. And there's R choose alpha plus beta duplicates. So then when we reduce this down, we get alpha plus beta. And so this is actually, it's sort of a quick little proof due to time but this is the left side and that was the right side because we're combinations of size alpha plus beta on this side and then the right side was just simply alpha plus beta oh that should be choose there shouldn't be a line there alpha plus beta choose alpha you know then it'd be x plus beta okay so now on to the proof now we have those two backgrounds down if we look at bm we want M events to happen, exactly M events. So if we look at these M events to happen and not those, that's one possibility. So we have then we have to pick another M earns and calculate that probability of those events happening and not the others. And this is what that represents. We're going to sum over all JM over all uh, JM, which means we're going to, you know, pick M at a time and then sum over all possibilities. So that is BM. That's the number of ways that this can happen. Okay. But since that's the sum of disjoint sets, okay, that's what this is. If we, if we set up an indicator function for BM, so when BM happens, and since the sum of disjoint sets, that's really just the sum over all JM possibilities of the indicator function of that intersection. Well, the indicator of an intersection is actually the product of those indicator functions. So that's, so that's AI1 all the way up to AIM. That's all those events. And since those are complements, we can take one minus them, and that's, and that's the product. Well, this product is something that we just studied. <coughs> that is this. So it's one minus H1 JM, and, and we're taking out the indexes that we used here. And then it's all possible two-way combinations, but we're taking out the M that we used. Right, because these are the M's of the events that we don't didn't want to happen. So that is this sum. Well, now we take this product times one, and this product times this, and this product times that. Well, then we get this. So this here is the sum of all combinations of M. Okay? Then this, there's M here and 1 here. So then that formula that we just looked at, this, this sum is M plus 1, choose M, H of M plus 1. And then when we take this times this, we get this. And we go all the way to here, and then we get this. Well, now these H's, you know, here we used I's, which are indicator functions. The, or in our example, we used an X. So if we take the expected value of this, of this, and this, well, the expected value of this is just the probability of being in that event. But the expected value of these indicator functions, the sum of these indicator functions, is actually how we defined SM, the probability of all combinations choose an M at a time. And then this would be this. That's a constant that comes out front, and we get this as the expectation. Well, that's it. Well, and this is the formula that we wanted to prove. It's the probability that exactly M events happen. And, th and then once you have this for any specific M, you know, then it could be zero or one, or you know, you, you pick it. And then the probability of C and the probability of DM are very straightforward after that. 
Well, that's all I have for today. Hope you enjoyed the video. I did. I enjoyed creating it. Um, please like it and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Thanks. Bye.